Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I will show you solutions to randomly selected paper 4 questions. Now these are questions that my students had to answer in the mock exam they wrote in preparation for this year's CIE exams. So I've chosen some of them that were a bit confusing for the students just so you can see the tricks um, that you might encounter in certain questions and sort of get the context with which you should answer questions. So this was the first question that they had to deal with. So as usual, I will annotate with my red pen over here. So this was the A part and from A, they had to answer these four questions before coming to B. So here it says figure 6.1 shows the concentration of two hormones, estrogen and progesterone in a woman's blood during one menstrual cycle. And over there you can see estrogen is with the solid line and progesterone is with the dotted line and it's marked into phases so the menstrual cycle has been separated into phases then it says with reference to figure 6.1 state the letter of the stage of the cycle during which ovulation occurs ovulation certainly occurs here at c because if you recall correctly when we did the menstrual cycle under hormonal co coordination we said that there is usually a surge in estrogen that then results in an increase in luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. And when those two increase, that is where you would find um, ovulation occurring. Mm. So your answer here has to be C. Um, state how figure 6.1 shows that the woman did mm. not become pregnant during this cycle. So if you look at figure 6.1 here, the um, progesterone decreases. So if you remember that the the point of progesterone in the menstrual cycle is to ensure that the woman is able to maintain the endometrium. So again, remember, the progesterone maintains the endometrium or the uterine lining in preparation for a baby, so a fertilized egg. And if there is no fertilization that happens, progesterone will then decrease. So the answer here would be progesterone decreases at E. Um, name the ovarian structure that secretes progesterone after ovulation. That is the corpus luteum. And please get this spelling correctly because I've seen that students typically, um, they sort of know what it sounds like, but they're not sure. So they would write all kinds of um, words that might sound like it, but are not it. So that's L-U-T-E-U-M. So that's the corpus luteum. State the role of progesterone in um, section D, which is this over here. And the role of progesterone, like I said earlier, is to maintain the endometrium or the, endo uh, or the uterine lining. Please do not say the endometrial lining because the mark scheme marks you wrong for that. The endometrium itself is a sort of lining. It's the wall of the uterus. So you can also say it maintains the endometrium or the uterine lining, and that would be correct. Then in B, it says the combined, combined contraceptive pill contains estrogen and progesterone. Explain how this pill works to prevent pregnancy. So the first thing here is to just remember that whenever you have an increase in progesterone, then that means that LH and FSH, so that's the luteinizing hormone and this um, follicle stimulating hormone, so FSH, would be inhibited. Okay, so I'm just going to write that as INH, inhibited. So LH and FSH are inhibited, what you would also find is that if these are inhibited, then there would be no spike in this section of C, um, which we've pointed at over here, of LH and FSH. So that means there'll be no ovulation. So no ovulation. All right. And um, something else that the progesterone and estrogen combined pill does is that it thickens the cervical mucus. Um, so the cervical mucus, I'm just going to write cervical here so that you can see how it's spelled. So basically the mucus in the cervix thickens the cervical mucus so that the sperm is unable to penetrate um, and reach the, the egg. And also this pill would prevent implantation. So there is no implantation of the egg even if fertilization occurs. So prevents implantation. And the reason implantation is prevented mostly is because the estrogen is terribly high um, when you take this pill. Okay, so prevents implantation. And those would be your answers for that question. And this was eight marks in total, by the way, because question B was four marks and this here was four marks. 
Let's look at another question that they had to work with. So here it says the Javan given um, is an endangered species and the figure there shows a female given with an infant. Javan gibbons live in fragmented patches of undisturbed forest in western Java, Indonesia. Habitat loss has reduced the population of wild gibbons to around 4,500 individuals, suggests why the separation of their habitat into small fragments rather than a single area poses a threat to the long-term survival of these species. So over here, what you need to talk about is the vulnerability that an animal would face if it lived in a small population away from a larger pack. So in this case, we have fragmented patches. So it means that they live in small populations. And one big disadvantage of that is that there is less allele frequency or less genetic variation. Okay. Because basically when they're in a small pack, it means that they're simply mating with each other. So there'll be um, less genetic variation in that case. And if there's less genetic variation, it means that you would have, um, so just I'm just gonna write it as that, less genetic variation, that means you would have less heterozygosity. So it means that there's inbreeding depression. That's also a very good word to use here um, to just say there's, I'm just, I'm writing here heterozygosity. Um, so it's a good thing also here to say there'll be inbreeding depression. Um, it's easy for them to be wiped out by a disastrous event because, for example, if there's a fire or um, a flood, then there's a chance that their habitat will be destroyed. And because they're so small in population, in small fragments, then there's also an increased chance of them being wiped off by such an event. Um, so for here, you have three marks for this question. So you have to state three different things, all right? Um, so that would be um, less genetic diversity, less heterozygosity, inbreeding depression, um, chances of them being wiped out due to, um, what's it called, due to an issue with, due to an environmental disaster. You could also talk about the fact that it's easy for them to die off um, in, a, in a situation whereby there's maybe scarcity for, of food or anything like that. So just bear that in mind. Then explain the meaning of the term biodiversity, and this is for two marks. So in many cases, students simply said, well, biodiversity is the variation of life forms in an ecosystem, and that is not wrong. But for two marks, you need to go a little bit beyond that and mention, because it also says explain, it doesn't say define. So when you're explaining, you would then mention that biodiversity refers to the diversity of habitats, the number of species, and the genetic variation within those species. And that would give you full marks here. All right, here's another question. Oisid rape, which is also canola, has been genetically modified to be resistant to herbicides that contain glufosinate ammonium. The genetically modified oisid rape contains the bar gene obtained from a soil bacterium. This gene codes for an enzyme that converts glufosinate ammonium into a non-toxic compound. A, outline the advantages to farmers of growing glufosinate, glufosinate resistance oil seed rape. So here again, you have two marks. And obviously you might say, well, I mean, I only have one thing to say, but there are two things that you can't say here. And the, the first thing is that if you grow this um, oil seed rape that is resistant to the herbicide, you can increase yield, okay? So just increasing yield um, for the farmers. And the second thing is that you can kill weeds that compete with the plant without killing the plant itself because it is so resistant. So that's something that you can, those are the two things you can say there that would get you full marks. And I must say, and I think I'm reiterating this, that when you're answering questions in CIE, please don't write essays unnecessarily. Over here, for example, it says just outline. So just come and write one thing, two things, and then you're done. You don't need to fill up the entire space or draw arrows from the answer sheet trying to find extra spaces to write. Please do not do that. All right, let's go on. The bar gene was introduced into oisid rape using plasmids. Plasmids also contain the promoter from, taken from tail crest, um, and it says, I'll find the structure of a plasmid. This is another confusing question that I find that students struggle with because when it says outline the structure of a plasmid, many students start to talk about the features of a plasmid. But the structure of a plasmid is basically what you can see when you look at it. And what you can see with a plasmid is that it is circular and it is small. Please avoid saying that a plasmid is a loop. Okay, 
don't say it's a loop. This would be marked wrong because a loop is not necessarily circular. And I know that we associate the word with circular, but basically a loop is something that has closed ends. And so we're just going around um, the shape, whatever shape it might be. So it's not a loop. You can say it is circular and it is small. And that would be the structure of a plasmid. And that would give you full marks here. Then the third question, explain how the properties of plasmids make them suitable for genetic modification programs. And this is where you can then speak about the features, because again, it says the properties. So one property of plasmids is that they have marker genes, and those marker genes enable um, scientists to detect if the plasmid has been taken up. So the feature in this case would be marker genes. Okay. And you can say enables um, scientists to detect if a plasmid has been taken up. The other thing you can speak about is the fact that plasmids replicate fast. Um, so it's, it's easy for them to replicate the gene that you're trying to introduce. Um, you can also talk about the fact that plasmids have um, an origin of replication um, that sort of helps with their replication process. You can also speak about the fact that plasmids have many restriction sites. So restriction sites, that's something from um, chapter 19. Um, which we might not get to before your exams, but I hope that um, it helps. So restriction sites, these are the sites where restriction enzymes cut the plasmid in order to allow for the insertion of new genes. So all you have to do here is just state three different things um, and then explain why they are important or why they are helpful and you would get full marks. So here replicates fast and that would give you your three marks there. Obviously, you need to add a bit more flesh here, but using the explanations I just gave you, I believe you'll be able to do that. Okay, this is another question, and I found this question really interesting because for many students, they got it right to a certain extent, but they ignored um, certain keypads. So that's, what I, that's why I put it here in the video so that you can see what your errors might be and avoid losing marks. So this was for four marks here. And it just says figure 7.1 shows a pedigree diagram of the inheritance of the ABO blood group system. The blood group of some individuals is given in the pedigree. So first things first that you need to bear in mind is that A and B are dominant to O. So I'm just going to write it this way as A and B and then write it this way. Okay. Obviously, this is not how it is depicted, but it's my way of explaining it to you. That A and B are both dominant. O is recessive. Okay. So now let's go on. If you want to read a pedigree successfully, please pay attention to where the lines are joining. Whenever you have an, a horizontal line between two of them like this, it's telling you that these two mated with each other to produce offspring. Okay, And so the arrow would then come down this way. So these are their offspring. And obviously by seeing that, you can tell that these two then mated with each other and they made the offspring that are down here at the bottom all right and same thing here so just wanted to point that out i'm now going to erase these so that we can actually work on the problem all right so let's go on then so here it says this guy a mated with this person one and they had a child who was um, blood group b all right and this person so you just have to guess then what would be the genotype or rather what would be the blood group of number four as well because number four is one of their offspring well if a person is a if a person is blood group a there are two possibilities their genotype could be ia io okay or it could be ia and by the way i is just a denotion for like just assume it's like the chromosome carrying the allele so it doesn't mean anything special. So a genotype for someone who's A could be IAIO or IAIA. What this is telling you is that A is dominant. So even if the person is carrying the O allele, they would still express the blood group A. Or they could have two A alleles, in which case they would be blood group A. Now for this person to have mated with someone else and made a child that is B, then it means that their partner is B. I hope this makes sense because that's the only way they would make B based on what you can see here. Um, and you can you can also check. You can just say, let's do, if we were to do IAIA times IB, IB, we would find that all the offspring would be AB. 
but that's not what I'm trying to prove you. I'm just trying to show you that you need someone who has been in order to make a child that's been. So then we go on and obviously over here, we come here rather, and we can see that over here, um, there's, a, there's an offspring that's A, B, and there's one that's O, and we have two parents. Obviously, for these two parents to make a child that's A, B, they are either A or B. So it's either A or B over here. And over here, it's either A or B as well. So if I were to write this in the table so that it's not confusing for you, let's look here. Individual 1, the phenotype we said has to be B because there's no other way they would make an offspring with B if the one parent is A. The genotype of this offspring in this case will then be IB. Okay, this is how you write the genotype. It would be I, B, I, B. All right, so that is what is happening here. It can't be I, A, I, B, because that then would make this person A, B. All right, then we come here where they've made a child that is O and they've also made a child that is A, B. What that tells us is that number two is either A or B. And that means that the genotype would be I, A, now, because they've made a child that is O, it means this person here is also carrying O. So it's not I-A-I-A, -A -A, it's I-A-I-O or I-B-I-O. I hope this makes sense. All right. Then, that then would explain, because let's think about it. If we had A-O, I'm just going to draw it here. If we had A-O and we had B-O, I'm going to do a cross here. So you can see what I'm saying. And you can always use these crosses to check if your answers make sense. I A um, A O B O, if we were to cross them together, this is what we would get. So you can see there that there's the formation of a child that would express O. There's the formation of a child that would express A, B. There's also a, a chance of a child expressing just B and a chance of a child expressing A. So this way we know that it's A, O, B, O for these two parents. And so over here, you can also just write the exact same thing. It's B or A, and you just write those genotypes there as well. Um, and then the reason why we say this is B or A, by the way, is because we don't know which parent is actually B and which one is A. We know that one of them has to be B and the other one has to be A but we have no assurance of which one it is. That is why we write it this way. So by all means, make sure you indicate these differences and also write out the genotypes for the two possibilities so that you don't lose any marks. And now let's look at candidate number four over here. So number four here has mixed with O, has mated with O, and they have an offspring that is O and one that is A. So definitely for them to make an offspring that is A, candidate number four certainly has to be A. And that would be I, A, I, O. Again, has to be O. This O has to be here because, like we said, O is recessive. So for O to be expressed in the offspring, both parents must be carrying O um, in their genotype. I hope that was clear to you. If it wasn't, again, just ask questions as much as you can. All right, let's go on and look at a question on photosynthesis. So it says here that the rate of photosynthesis is affected by a number of environmental factors. And it shows us this graph where we have um, rate of photosynthesis plotted against light intensity. And the graph has sort of been split into different stages. So we have A, B, and we also have C. Then it says state the limiting factor in the region of A. So it's basically saying state the limiting factor around here of the graph. I'm going to erase that now so that... You can also see it very clearly. The limiting factor in this case would be light intensity. The reason for this is that at this point between A and where it gets to like a plateau, light intensity is increasing slowly. And what that means is that light intensity has an impact on the reaction because, because it is available in its lowest amount. And that leads us to the next question that says, explain what is meant by the term limiting factor. 
a limiting factor, and I discussed this when I did the video on photosynthesis, that a limiting factor is a factor that is available in the slowest amount or in the lowest amount, and as a result, limits the rate of the reaction. So let's say, for example, we had A plus B, and these two have to react to form C. And then when C is formed, it must react with D in order to form E. And if we brought in some chemistry and we said, well, for every one mole of A, we need one mole of B to react in order to form C. But for some reason, we have 100 moles of A, and over here we have 5 moles of B. The limiting factor in this case becomes B, because once B is used up, or B is not enough, rather, we can't make C. And if we can't make C, there's nothing to react with D in order to form E. So that is what the limiting factor means. It is the factor in a reaction that is available in the, in the smallest amount and therefore has a limit on the rate of the reaction. The last question says, explain why there is no further increase in the rate of photosynthesis beyond point C. And this is a good question because even though we are increasing light intensity over here, the rate of reaction does not increase beyond this point. It reaches a plateau. And what this simply tells us is that light intensity is no longer the limiting factor. There is something else, perhaps carbon dioxide concentration or temperature that is now limiting the reaction but we don't have a graph for it. So that would be your answer here, that something else is now limiting the rate of the reaction beyond point C. And then you'd give an example saying carbon dioxide or temperature in order for you to get the full two marks. This was another question that really, really confused students, and I'll, I'll tell why. It's not because they're dumb or anything, but really because the question just seemed really tricky for them. It says, for many plants living in temperate regions, the optimum temperature for photosynthesis is approximately 25 degrees Celsius. It suggests reasons why the rate of photosynthesis decreases at temperatures above 25. Now, many students, because they see temperature and they know photosynthesis has enzymes, said correctly, and correctly so, by the way, that the enzymes denature, or Rubisco, which is the enzyme in photosynthesis that we're all aware of, denatures. So enzymes denature. Okay? But what they then went on to do is they started to explain enzymes. They started to say, well, enzymes have an active site, and when the temperature is too high, the active site um, loses its shape. All of that is correct, but think of the context of the paper you're writing. This is a paper for paper, not a paper to paper. If you wrote all of those things in paper two under the same question, you would get full marks for that because paper two deals with AS level content, and that is where you find the chapter on enzymes. In this case, you're dealing with photosynthesis, which is A level content. So beyond saying enzymes to nature and getting one mark here, if you go on to explain issues with the active site, you will not get full marks. What you need to say is talk about how photorespiration would happen. Like I said in the photosynthesis videos, which I hope that you've watched, that photorespiration would happen when temperatures are high. Okay? And in this case, the relative temperature is high for these plants, and so they would have photorespiration. At, very high, at such high temperatures, the stomata would likely close, so you have to then talk about the closing. I'm just going to write it as CLO of stomata. The closing of the stomata, and that means that you would have less photosynthesis happening, and as a result of that, less carbon dioxide will be fixed, because, um, and you could even relate the less carbon dioxide being fixed to the denaturation of the enzymes. And that would give you four full marks. So just saying here, um, less CO2 fixed. Okay. And that would give you full marks here. And that would be that on that. So this is just really, really straightforward questions. But again, always be aware of the context of the paper you are answering. So here is a good question on coordination, and this is this is one of the questions I really love. Um, coordination, I feel, is a very easy chapter to um, sort of make sense of. Um, coordination, homeostasis, those are really amazing chapters. So if you dislike them, please just check out the videos that I made on those cha um, on those chapters, and I promise you, you will fall in love with them again. So here we go. It says this shows a mammalian neuromuscular junction. 
And what you can see here, I'm just going to annotate as usual, this is what we would call the presynaptic neuron. Okay, and it's already been labeled here that that's the presynaptic membrane. So it ends over there and it has a little space in between. And then there's a postsynaptic membrane, which is also the sacrolemma. The sacrolemma is simply the, um, the muscle fiber, all right? So this is telling us that a muscle is, being, is receiving signals from a neuron. And in this case, you can think of it as the effector receiving a signal from the, um, so it goes from sensory neuron to relay neuron, and then it goes to the motor neuron. So this would likely be a motor neuron. Um, which has also been labeled there, I've just noticed. Okay, so it says um, use label lines to um, indicate the following paths. So I've, I found that students were quite confused here and what they started to do was to just draw random lines in places where things just should not be. So for example, some students drew lines here to tell me that that was actin. Um, that is not actin. If you need to draw a line that's showing actin and myosin, and I know this is not the perfect image to do so. You need to be looking here where it says the myofibrils. Your actin would be the lines that are the thin lines, while your myosin would be the thick lines. And when I refer to the thin and the thick lines, I'm referring solely to the horizontal lines. So you can't draw this vertical line here. You can't put a line to this one and say this is myosin. That would be inaccurate, okay? That is simply the Z disk, I believe. That is um, sort of showing one sacrolemma from the other, so one muscle fiber from the other. So you need to find the thin lines in the image and then you draw your line there to indicate actin, whereas for actin and myosin, you need to look for where the thin line and the thick line are overlapping each other. So that I can easily see here, so I'm just going to draw it here. This would be a region with actin and uh, myosin, so I can label that with B. And then for actin only, I just need to look for um, a thin line, and then that would be my A, all right? Then outline how an action potential arriving at this muscular, neuromuscular junction can result in depolarization. So this is a synapse, all right? Again, if you're not sure of what you're looking at, look at the labels. Over here, for example, it says synaptic cleft. So that tells you that you're dealing with a synapse, and you need to remember how synapses work. So what happens in a synapse? This membrane, which is the um, presynaptic membrane or the presynaptic neuron, gets depolarized. And due to that, so you just need to say, and again, it's a four mark, so you have to say four things, okay? So action potential in presynaptic membrane um, would result in the opening of calcium-gated channels, all right? So action potential, calcium-gated channels will open and obviously, I'm not going to um, write everything out. So I'm just going to write the key things you need to know. Calcium channels open. And once the calcium channels open here, um, that will result in vesicles containing acetylcholine um, are released. So vesicles um, for acetylcholine, which I'll just write as ACH, are released. All right. The vesicles will then bind to the presynaptic membrane, so bind to presynapse membrane. And when they bind to the presynapse membrane, they would then, and by the way, you need to write all this because um, otherwise whatever you're saying might not make sense. So to presynapse membrane, and then molecules of acetylcholine are released and they bind to receptors on the sacrolemma. Because again, remember, they're telling you the sacrolemma is the postsynaptic membrane. So the vesicles will bind here and they release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft and it goes and binds to receptors on the sacrolemma. Once it binds to those receptors on the sacrolemma, the sacrolemma itself then releases, opens its sodium gated channels, becomes depolarized, and that is what happens. And that would simply give you the full four marks that you need here. So the last part of this video, I want to focus on the last questions you will encounter in your paper four. When you get to the end of your paper four, you will find that there are 15 mark questions. There are usually two of them, and they're usually number nine and number 10. You are required to only answer one of those questions. So please, when you are picking the question you want to answer, don't pick 9A and 10B, all right? Please don't do that because 
that would not be counted as you answering one question. You need to, you can't say, oh, I know 9A, uh, but I don't know 9B, so I'm just going to pick 10B. That's not how it works. If you've decided to answer question number nine, please stick with question number nine. You have to answer every single thing on this question. So for example, because I know what is on the next slide and I can answer both of them, but I feel more comfortable or more conf confident with question nine, that means I will answer only question nine for 15 marks. And the way you can decide which one to answer is to look at what the marks are. Over here, it says eight marks for this question. Do you know eight points about um, the reabsorption of glucose in the kidney? If you do, then you, you, you have your question. Do you know seven points about the role of ADH when water potential of the blood decreases? If you do, then you have your question. Even if you don't have all the points, but let's say, for example, over here you have six, and maybe over here you also have, let's say you have six. That's going to give you 12 out of 15. Okay, if on the next question you only know that you're confident of getting 8 out of 15, then you pick the one that gives you the higher marks, all right? Don't pick the one that you feel like, if I answer this one, they would feel like I'm really intelligent, because that's not how it works. They mark based on the answers that you provide. All right, so let's look at this, question 9. How is glucose reabsorbed from the kidney? The first thing I would expect students to say here is that the selective reabsorption of glucose in the kidney happens in the proximal convoluted tubule, okay? I would also expect students to tell me that it is through the process of secondary active transport. This means that glucose itself is not actively transported, but through the actions of the sodium potassium pump, um, it, is, it is then secondary active transport. Then the third thing would be to speak about the cells that line the proximal convoluted tubule. And I am drawing here, but you are not required to draw, except the question says with the aid of a diagram, or they say you may use a diagram if you wish. I'm just doing this to explain to you. So we know that there are cells lining the proximal convoluted tubule over here. And we know that the glomerular filtrate that contains glucose is flowing through here. So the first thing that I would then expect students to say here is that the cells lining the proximal convoluted tubule will pump sodium ions out um, into the tissue fluid surrounding the, the nephron, all right? As a result of that, there would be a decrease in sodium ion concentration inside the cells. Now, in order to balance that decrease, sodium ions in the glomerular filtrate need to move into the cells all right, through the cell membrane. Now, because they can't cross the cell membrane, they go through a transport protein. That transport protein is also called a co-transporter, and it binds to glucose and amino acids as it transports sodium um, ions. And this is how glucose is then moved into the cells, and from there it diffuses out into the surrounding tissue fluid. So I'm just going to put that in words, but obviously not in full words, so that you can see if we have eight points. So cells um, lining the proximal convoluted tubule will pump out sodium ions, okay? That creates concentration gradient of sodium ions. And obviously you need to say here using sodium potassium pump, okay? So the sodium potassium pump, because that is where the active transport part comes in. Then concentration gradient is created in the cells, okay, of sodium, for sodium that is. That's created in the cells. And then sodium needs to move into the um, cells. So sodium moves to a transport protein. So I'm just going to write transport protein as that. Then you need to say that this transport protein is a co-transporter, and this is a word that is loved for this question in particular. Okay, so co-transporter, and it also binds to glucose. So co-transporter again binds to glucose um, as well as binds to glucose as it transports sodium. 
okay then you can also then say here which would be our eight points that all glucose is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule and there we've done it eight points that's all you need to do. Students also, because this question has a lot of writing space, tend to take their time to write long essays. But the truth is that CIE is not looking for you to write an essay. They are not marking you for English. They are marking you for your biology understanding. So as succinctly as possible, make sure you communicate your understanding and make it really clear. So we've done 9A. That's literally all that you need to do, obviously in fuller sentences. And then let's look at 9B. Yeah, it says the role of ADH um, when water potential in the blood decreases. Um, so first things first would be the osmoreceptors that detect that water potential is decreased. Okay. And when the osmoreceptors um, do that, they will activate um, or send signals to the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland receives a signal and as a result of that the pituitary gland will release ADH now in this case you need to be specific about which pituitary gland um, so if it's the anterior or posterior one all right because if you say just pituitary gland sometimes they mark you wrong so then the pituitary gland release AD, will release ADH okay ADH will cause the will cause the um, release of vesicles called aquaporins. Okay, so aquaporins. And again, this is all under homeostasis. So please check out those videos if you're finding this information a little bit confusing. The aquaporins will then go and bind to the walls of, collect, of the collecting duct of the nephron. So walls of collecting ducts is where the aquaporins will bind um, of the nephron. And once they bind there, they will stimulate the uptake of water from urine. So that causes, um, or rather they make the walls more permeable to water, basically. That's what you can also say. Um, so I'm just going to erase that there. So walls of collecting ducts is where the aquaporins will bind and they make the walls more permeable so I'm just going to write it as more perm to water. Okay. Now, once we have an increased permeability to water, water is taken up from urine. Okay. Water is taken up. And that results in the person having concentrated urine with a small volume. Okay. Now we're going to see if we have all the points that we need for this question. Concentrated urine, small volume. So just write in here, small. Okay. Now let's look at how many points this is. That's one, that's two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. As a matter of fact, we have eight. So there, and this will give you full 15 marks. So when you see this question in the exam, please don't be nervous about it. Don't get scared. Don't feel the need to write things that are not associated. Don't provide examples except you've been asked to. Simply provide the facts. And you'd find that you would not use more than two of the pages, like just one side of the paper and the other side. You don't have to use all the pages if you know your stuff. Okay, this is another example of a 15 mark question. And over here, it's talking about photosynthesis. And here it's asking how rice is adapted to grow with the roots subject, um, submerged in water. So if you've watched the adaptations of rice to wet environments video, then um, this should be easy peasy for you. So over here, you need to speak about the things like the erenchyma. Um, I don't want to spend too much time writing it out, but obviously I hope you get the gist from the previous question. So you need to speak about things like the erenchyma, the air spaces with, between the leaves, the fact that the roots are able to make um, ethanol, um, and as a result of that, they, and they have a high tolerance for ethanol, um, so that enables them to live in water even though there is um, less air available to them. 
and also you can speak about the things like the plants grow really tall so their leaves are always above the water and as a result of that they're able to receive gases from the air um, so that they can photosynthesize that already would give you six points i'm sure because i'm sure i've said more than six things then the b part says explain how the leaves of maize or sagam are able to maximize carbon dioxide fixation at high temperatures this is a question about C4 plants. The examples of C4 plants are plants like maize and sorghum. So when they say maize and sorghum, don't freeze up and say, oh my goodness, but I didn't learn about maize. Uh, maize is a C4 plant. Sorghum is a C4 plant. So when you discuss this, you're basically discussing the issues with um, photosynthesis at high temperatures for C4 plants. So in this case, you would speak about, for example, um, C maize and sorghum are C4 plants. That, that should be one point for you. And then you go on to say, these plants have a problem with rubisco. And that's already another, um, another point because rubisco um, catalyzes the reaction between RUBP and oxygen, resulting in photorespiration. That sentence alone gives you two points because RUBP plus oxygen, photorespiration, those are key things. Then you go on to talk about how these plants then have a different method of getting carbon dioxide to RUBP and Rubisco by hiding RUBP and Rubisco in their bundle sheath cells. Then you talk about how CO2 is taken up from the air and it is combined with a three carbon compound called PEP, um, which is phosphoenol pyruvate. The enzyme that catalyzes that is phosphoenol, um, it's PEP carboxylase rather, so that's PEP carboxylase. Um, PEP carboxylase will add CO2 to, um, P, to PEP itself, and that results in the formation of oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is converted to malate. Malate is then transported into the bundle sheet cells where CO2 is extracted from it and is then able to react with RUBP in the presence of rubisco without the contamination of oxygen. And that is typic that is just the answer. And I know you're just like, wait, what? So you can rewind it and listen again and just write down the points and tell and count for yourself if you have nine points and you'd be surprised that you already do. So the point of this is just to let you know to not be nervous about this question when you encounter it. It is not hard. The 15 mark questions are not hard. And also remember, you only have to answer one of them. So pick the one that you are really, really, really good at and leave the other one, okay? Don't answer both and don't try to answer small sections of both. So don't say 9A and 10B or 10B, um, 10A and 9B. Don't do that. Or 10B, 10A. Don't do anything like 10B, 9A rather. Don't do that. Make sure that you answer the one particular question, both the A and B parts. I wish you good luck in the upcoming exams and I hope I'm able to get chapter 18 out to you on time so that you can at least feel a little confident there but I can't promise that chapter 19 will be ready. All the best and I wish you good luck. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.